Parker, expected approach time 34, approach button 17, the altimeter 299 or 7. DCS Situation Report, where we discuss news and information about DCS World. I'm your host, Prickly Hedgehog, and I do hope this video finds you well as you tune into today's episode, which features some big developments on numerous modules, including the F-16C Viper and the MI-24 Behind. We'll start with some news that affects a variety of modules and systems within the game, and that's the flare tweaks ED are making, and they are based on feedback from the community. Team have tuned the flare image level and gain settings for both the lightning and at flare targeting pods, as well as infrared guided Maverick air to surface missiles. The next main task is to complete infrared textures for all ships and aircraft. This will include flare effects for improvements to explosions, smoke, and dust. The visual tweak will embellish the immersion aspect of that feature of the game. I appreciate the willingness of ED to listen to this kind of feedback from the community. Obviously, if you have a particular bug or issue you'd like to raise with the ED team, then do dip into the forum section of their website, as that is the best place to troubleshoot, provide bug information, or gather information on specific topics pertaining to the game. Let's turn to the Hind, the burly beast of the attack helicopter genre, uh, whose development appears to be progressing rather positively. One of these developments is Armament, and ED have introduced the APU-61 and APU-62 missile launchers, which are placed on the outer weapon pylon racks, and they can accommodate one or two missiles per launcher respectively. After the missile's power is engaged, warm-up will take one minute before it can be used, the pylon selector on the same panel will choose the missile launcher, and after the missile launcher is switched on, it will take an additional 10 seconds for the missile's gyros to spin up. The R-60 missiles use the Peltier effect, which is also called the thermoelectric cooling. It transfers heat from one side of the device to the other, and does not use any additional consumables to cool the seeker. The pilot uses the ASP-17V aiming sights in a circle to aim and obtain a missile tone for launch. If the missile locks a target, its seeker is uncaged automatically and tracks the target within the seeker's capabilities. If target lock is lost, the seeker is recaged automatically. It is worth mentioning that the missile was used against ground targets as well and ED are planning to add this capability later within DCS overall. It's good news. Now it's not clear yet at just how much of a slew angle the target seeker has, the missile seeker has, so we'll have to wait and see a little bit more information about that in the near future. Again though, it's another interesting development for the Hind, which is a capable machine and formidably armed and armoured. The air-to-air -air capability will add a layer of offensive and defensive lethality, I think, especially against other helicopters, but potentially too against their other air threats as well. It's progressing nicely, as I said, and in addition to this weapon, ED advised that the cord heavy machine gun and gunner are also being prepared for the hind. The new 3D character model and animations are nearing completion, and they are planning to release it in one of the upcoming updates. You will be able to mount the machine gun on the right or the left side of the helicopter, and it will have the same features as the MI-8, of course, the Magnificent 8, and the TCS Huey gunners. Uh, again, another layer to the bristling armament of the Hind, so stay tuned for what that looks like in the next update planned, I believe, for June. Who's flying right now? It's kind of is, because I, I don't think I've got my control set up, or certainly I don't trust them yeah. to uh, plummet us into the desert. Well, turning now to the Viper, and I'm sure fans will be grinning from ear to ear with news about more improvements to the flight model for the jet. They include the flight control systems adjustments, 
which will see increased negative G capabilities, a smooth transition between flight and landing gear modes, improved roll rate logic, greater rudder authority, which will allow knife edged passes. Nice. Eliminated your instability when low and very fast, as well as reduced G bucket effects when at high G and accelerating through Mark, which uh, should be interesting. Now the Viper will have the ability to sustain 9.3 G when the energy state allows and the flight control system gains in landing and aerial refueling modes are also being updated, which will be good news for many of you. Additionally, improved stability when firing the gun and greater negative G will be available when using manual pitch override or MPO. Also, the flight control system allows you to hold negative 3G. So stay tuned for these updates, which are coming soon. I'm not sure if that's going to be part of the June update, but I suspect some of these things may be implemented. As I said before, the next big patch for open beta has previously been indicated for this coming June. Now, I'm not sure of the real benefits of negative G states, because as we know, in real world situations, pilots generally avoid negative Gs like the plague. But the overall improvements sound really, really promising. It's a notoriously nimble aircraft, the F-16, and if you've been listening to any of the fighter pilot podcast episodes lately, you'll have heard the discussion about the use of the F-16 as an adversary aircraft in the famous Top Gun school, which were flown to their capabilities repeatedly, eventually, of course, re uh, causing them to retire uh, just due to the frequent use. I think Jello pointed out it wasn't to do with excessive G or ridiculous maneuvering by the Top Gun instructors, rather just repeatedly pushing those aircraft to their uh, limits, capable limits, which of course eventually is going to uh, speed up the general fatigue on the airframe, which is a natural part of all aircraft's uh, flight time. Now in game, of course, these increased performances that we discussed are going to please Viper fans. And I think this is a particularly important update for the preparation of the Typhoon, which may end up cutting the figure of the best fighter in the game once it is released. The question will be, can the Viper compete? Well, as we know, as it's been famously said, it's the pilot in the box that counts the most. So keep your eyes peeled for more updates on that. And let me know what your thoughts are as to the capabilities of these two aircraft. It's a little bit of a, um, well, nonsense uh, pissing match, but uh, nonetheless, it's a, it's a point of discussion as uh, all comparisons between uh, fighter aircraft are. Now, speaking of fighter aircraft, or not so much a fighter aircraft, but a bombing aircraft, the F-15E and RASBAM threw out yet another tasty video overview of the MFDs in the F-15E, the second of its kind of a video in the kitchen of the cockpit, and navigating the various menus looks pretty familiar for those of us used to the modern fourth gen fighters in game, especially of course the Hornet and the Viper. As yet, of course, we don't have yet a confirmed release date for the Mud Hen, but I doubt the team would bother with such effort if there was no intent to push the aircraft into early access fairly soon. We'll have to stay tuned. Of course, it's a cooperative process between RASBAM and Eagle Dynamics. There's a process there between the uh, various studios, as you probably are aware, and has been discussed in third-party development videos previously. So we'll have to wait and see. It's not just a, sim a simple matter of a timeline. There are, of course, a lot of moving parts to these development processes. So we'll have to wait and see if we get a little bit more information. The same applies to the South Atlantic map as well, which I know many of you are eager to get hold of and which has received some very high praise over the last few weeks, especially as a result of the teaser videos from Growling Sidewinder. So keep your eyes on the news, the social media feeds, etc. I can't wait for the community members to enjoy the beauty of this map, which has been so lovingly created by the RASBAM team. Of course, and I've said this before, it involves thousands of hours of painstaking work, four years worth of work, and the details that you've seen thus far, uh, either in my video or any of the others that have come out recently, only cover a fraction of some of that effort. So the team have done a tremendous job, and I really, as I said, can't wait for you guys to get into that map and experience the beauty and the work that's been done there. So again, stay tuned for information. Hopefully we're going to get a you know, early access release date here soon. Now, another snippet of news this week comes from the India Fox Echo team, who released a teaser of their DCS MB339 
trainer fighter. Now this has been a work in progress for some time and is yet another full fidelity aircraft offering a two seat configuration, which is good news. It will nestle in next to the C-101 and the L-39 pretty comfortably and will offer virtual squadrons yet another option for a trainer aircraft and providing decent performance with a degree of complexity, a useful stepping stone for those pilots or virtual pilots looking to get into the more complex aircraft. So we'll see how this progress uh, evolves and whether we get an update on an early access release date. It's an aircraft I'm pretty interested in. And as uh, one of my fellow Kiwis pointed out, SAS Cat said it would be nice to see that in uh, Kiwi colors as well. So maybe, maybe, maybe we'll see what happens. Level 1 Nellis Tower, winds are 028 for 10, cleared for takeoff runway 03 left. Please expedite your departure. Now, speaking of two seater trainers, unfortunately, I have to say, I haven't heard much on the free module in this line the T-45 Goshawk from NVAO Simulations. Now that module has great potential, remember it is a free module, but alas there hasn't been much in the way of updates or news on the progress of that particular module. If anyone has any insight, please let me know. It's uh, the only trainer that I'm aware of that we have which is capable of landing on the carrier right now, as far as I'm aware, and I would love to see it in-game replacing the Hawk, which of course is often lamented as uh, one of those things we'd lost uh, to the community, it was a third-party module and they just weren't able to keep pace with the overall development of the game, unfortunately, which is a prereq for producing third-party modules. Uh, so we do have a little bit of a hole there, but I would like to know if that aircraft is still being worked on, if we uh, if we still have a, a viable module there. Uh, as I said, it's a very, very good one and I've enjoyed the time that I've had with it. And it does, like the other modules that we mentioned, have a lot of potential as a great trainer. Well, we're starting to wrap up this week's video here, and I'll start to end it here with a mention about the anticipated campaigns coming to the game soon, and one that I'm really looking forward to, and one that I'm sure you are fully aware of. It's the Raven 1 Dominant Fury campaign by Baltic Dragon. Now, BD posted a cover image which was shared by the author of the Raven 1 series, Kevin Miller, on Twitter recently, and all indications are that this is set for release very soon. As previously described, it features some of our favorite podcasters and real-world contributors to the DCS community, and it's a real thrill to have this kind of input by such people. Ward Carroll, for example, threw out a pic of his flight some rig recently and mentioned he was racking up some traps on the Forrestal with the F-14. It's a tremendous endorsement for the product, which can only hope to recreate aspects of the real thing. But if we have an endorsement of it like this, it says something about those aspects that are being recreated for us to enjoy, and that's really, really positive news, ladies and gentlemen. It's a cool thing. Lastly, I'd like to endorse uh, Top Gun Maverick, which I saw earlier this week on Monday. What a great movie. It was an absolute blast. Sure, there were some Hollywood liberties taken, but as a cinematic event, it checked all the right boxes for me and was a lot more entertaining than I expected, which was a good thing. Definitely worth seeing if you enjoyed the first one. It didn't disappoint, like I said, and the flying sequences are pretty good. And aspects of the mission making weren't entirely uh, impossible. Uh, and it was good story uh, stuff for Hollywood. And I, I, like I said, I really, really enjoyed it. So if you haven't seen it yet and you're considering it, definitely do. Go see it in the theater because it's pretty awesome. Uh, but if it's not your thing, well... You can always stick around and enjoy DCS because that's cool too. So, all right. Well, I think that's it for this week's DCS sit rep. I hope you enjoyed the video news this week. If you did, don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. It helps the channel. If you really want to support the channel and keep it chugging along, you can donate through the super thanks button now. And I really appreciate it. But of course, there's no obligation to do that whatsoever. I think that'll do. We'll see you next time on the DCS Situation Report. This is Preppy Hedgehog. Yeah, see ya boss. Thanks. <laughs>